I was made a chiefman, and they gave me the name Buzz Roll. I became a mighty warrior and could handle a tummy hawk and a booty knife with the best of them. Six years later, I left the wilderness and set up two trading posts. I also fought in the Seminole War and the California Revolution. I later, later met John Fremont and joined his expedition. I knew the wilderness so well that Fremont made me his chief scout. It was on this expedition that I discovered a pass through Seattle, Nevada mountains. You see, we were on one side of the mountain and gold had been discovered on the other side. I guess you can figure out what side most people wanted me on. I personally led the first wagon trains of settlers through the pass. Thousand more settlers and gold seekers followed. Some was looking for the gold fields of California and others were looking for land to sell. The Western Pacific Railroad built tracks right through the, through the pass as a gateway to the west. So now you see why I want you to see the Seattle and the Bottoms. Because I discovered a pass right through it. It's called the Beckworth Pass. And there's something else I want you to know. The adventures of Kid Carson, Daniel Boone, and David Crockett were all written about which made them famous mountain men. My life was just as or even more adventurous as theirs. Because I was born black, the story was failed to include me in the history of quest. So that's why I came back to tell you my story. So you will begin to learn the true story of the Western Frontier. Boys and girls, learn your history. We were left out of so much of the true history of this country. But with your help, it is not too late for us to be included. This is your moment in black history. Thank you very much. So as you can see, we played a very intricate part in America. And it's, it's growth. We made for strides and gains in every area, even though we weren't recorded as a part of history. Please listen to these history moments, and, and hopefully you'll learn something through them. Now we will prepare our hearts for prayer. Go before the Lord. Tell him our thoughts. Dear Lord and Father, thank you that you promised us that where two or three are gathered, you are in the midst. Lord, we welcome you amongst us today and celebrate the gifts of life that you have lavished upon each of us. We ask that you open our ears, O oh Lord, so that we may hear your voice. We ask that you open our minds so that we may receive your wisdom. Open our spirits, O oh Lord, that we may know your leading and your guidance. Open our hearts, O oh God, that we may receive your wondrous love. Lord God, all these things we ask in your glorious name. Amen. We know that the earth is the Lord and everything that and everything belongs to him. And he has made us stewards of that which he has given us. Scripture tells us in Luke 38, 6 and 38, to give and you will receive. The ways in which you can, you can give your support to this church and others, you can mail it in, you can drop it off at the church, or you can use the Giveify app. Please remember that the church still needs your support during these times in order to continue its ministries. Thank you for your support. Now we will have our scripture by Sister Shirley Peoples. The scripture is Matthew 48, verses 8 through 15. Miss Shirley Peoples. Good morning, everyone. Our scripture reads will come from Matthew 28, verses 8 through 15. So the women hurried away from the tomb, afraid yet filled with joy and ran to tell his disciples. Suddenly, Jesus met them. Greetings, he said. They came to him, clasped his feet, and worshiped him. 
instructed. And this story has been widely circulated among the Jews to this very day. May the Lord bestow a blessing on the hearing and doing his word, and surely he followed us close to his heart. Following his people, we will have a selection by Pastor Richardson. And following Pastor Richardson, the word will come to us by our pastor, Reverend Michael A. Frazier Sr., titled Reasons to Rejoice.
about Jesus getting up from a three-day-old grave. Not everyone went to rejoice. Not everyone, and I'm in the text. In fact, keep your Bible so we look at verses 11, 11, 12, and 13 of Matthew chapter 28. Not everyone went to shout when they heard about the events that went on, not just down at the cross, but they were just as upset with what went on concerning an empty casket down at the cemetery. Not everyone, the Bible says, rendered praise when they got the news about that great getting up morning. Not everyone was happy after hearing that the man that they had tried to keep down and the man that they had put down was now walking around above ground. Not everyone was worshiping and not everyone was rejoicing. Not everyone was lifting up holy hands for what was impossible with man, but only possible with God. Not everyone, the Bible says, was giving him praise. Instead, when you look at this text, look at your text, the Bible says that some of the folk, instead of praising, look at it, when, when they heard the news, they went to plot. I'm um, in the text. Look, look at them in verses 11 and 12. They, they, they were still plotting, trying to discredit what God had done and what God was getting ready to do. Instead of this being a praise moment, it became a plotting moment. Instead of this being a shouting moment, it became a scheming moment. Instead of this being a moment for rejoicing, it became a moment of rejection. They, they came up with a plan and with a plot to reject the resurrection of the risen Savior. In fact, the many of the ones who, who should have been praising, they were the main ones who were still doing the plot. I'm in the text. Look at verse 11. The text says, while the women were on their way to fulfilling God's purpose of telling his disciples the news about a risen Savior, giving them reasons to rejoice, giving them reasons to give God the glory and to meet Jesus. Look at verse 10. To meet Jesus and Galilee, verse 11 says, while they were on their way with God's purpose, some other folk were on their way to plot. It says the soldiers went into the city and look at it, were reported to the chief priest everything that had happened. And not everyone was overjoyed. Not everyone was consumed with praise. The Bible says not everyone. Come on, say not everyone. And when we see in the closing verses, of this text that the enemies of the cross were still trying to come up with some crap to discredit the resurrection of the Christ. They were already gathering to try and find a way around what had happened on that day because what happened on that day became problematic for many of the Jewish leaders. Think about it. If Jesus was really alive from the dead, and then, then the Jews had a real problem. It, it, it meant that their system of religion was dead, and that only a relationship with Jesus became a path to salvation. It meant, ultimately, that he was right, and they were what? Wrong. And so they had to find a way to silence his disciples, and so they came up with some shucky ducky quack quack to counteract what the rejoicing over the resurrection was all about on that great getting up morning. They were terrified by what the petrified soldiers told them. And by the way, by the way, and for the record, all religious systems of the world are still bothered by the empty tomb concerning the Christ. You can travel right now to China, and if you got to China and came across the tomb that Buddha was in, it will still say that it is occupied. In fact, you can travel all the way over to the Middle East. If you came across the tomb of Muhammad, it will still say that it's occupied. In fact, you can travel all the way over to the Red Republic of Russia and look in and see Stalin, see Lenin's body in a glass coffin. And you will see that he's still occupied. He's still there. But travel with me like the Bible says, down to dust the road to a place outside of a hill in, on Jerusalem. Look, look, go to that old tomb that was hewed out of the side of a rock. And I'll tell you, that's where they put his body. Yes, but early the Bible says on Sunday morning, what God got him up. That, that's why the songwriter said, I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is what? Living. No matter what men may say, the song 
says he lives, he lives. What? Salvation to impart. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. That, that empty tomb sounds the death knell to all other religious systems of the world. Look, look, there is one risen Savior, and his name is Jesus. There's only one way to heaven, and his name is Jesus. There's only one who descended from the deep, dark doors and dungeons of death to reverse rigor mortis and rise again. He came back, the Bible said, to life, and he came back with power over death, hell, and the grave. If you can't find any other reason to rejoice, you ought to rejoice over the resurrection of the one whose name is Jesus. Somebody ought to give him some praise right now. You got a reason to Rejoice. His resurrection is a problem for all who do not believe. So, so they tried to find a way to discount it. This is what the leaders in this text, look at them in this verse. This is what they're doing. They make up a lie to cover up the truth. They devised a scheme to avoid having to face all the facts. They were willing to choose darkness over light. Look at them. They heard the claims of the gospel. And they still turn a deaf ear to it. it. It never ceases to amaze me how some folks are more comfortable with hearing a lie because they cannot handle hearing the truth. Right? But because of their rejection, look, they tried to discredit the resurrection. Look at verses 14 and 15 with me. Their, their plan and their plot, it involves some perjury. Look at it. They, they agreed with the soldiers that if Pilate heard about this thing, look at it. They would lie to the life of them and get them off the hook. After all, a Roman soldier who fell asleep at his post, that also was, was carried a sentence of death. But, but notice what they told him to say. Look at it. They told him to, tell, tell, to say this. Look what they said. They said. His disciples came by night and did what? Stole him away. Good God from Zion. They came up with a plot. But God was still working God's plan. That, that's what we need to be reminded of. In fact, you ought to write this down. Write this down. That, 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 this is what I want to remind you of. Look at this text and write it down at the same time. Look, look. Man's plots can never overthrow God's plan. Mm -hmm. Why? Because God is still in charge. He's still in control and he's still in command. And when we allow God to order our steps, when we step over into the precincts of God's purpose and plan for our lives, we can rest assured of at least three things. Huh? We can rejoice about three things that, that if we just walk in God's divine purpose, there are three things in which we can give God praise for the Prince of Peace. Three reasons now I want to give you in terms of why we ought to worship the one who is wonderful and worthy what, of all the praise huh? in spite of man's plots. They, 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 they are what I call reasons to rejoice. Come on, say that one time. Reasons to rejoice. I'm going to give them to you now right quick and I'm going to leave you alone. Come on back to verses 8 and 9. We read it a moment ago. Look at it. Verse 8 says, the women, look at it, hurried away, afraid yet, but also filled with joy. Good God. Like, we call that mixed emotions. Glorifying God for what God had done. Matthew 28, verses 8 through 10. Look at it. We see these ladies leaving the tomb. Verse 8. And so the women, it says, they departed, heard, huh, quickly from the tomb with fear and great joy and ran to bring his disciples the word. Look, look at verse 9. And verse 9 says, and suddenly, behold, Jesus. Now stop right there. Stop right there. Remember, the angels, what the angel said back in verse 7. Back up to verse 7. And the angel of God had finished giving these sisters their marching orders, the message from God. Look at it. They did what he said to do. Look at it. Verse 7, the messenger said, go quickly. And what? Tell his disciples. And then verse 8 says, so, so they left what? Quickly. They, they did what he said. And notice, if you will, in verse 8, that as they went, they had mixed emotions. Yes, they had mixed emotions as they carried out the Lord's command. They had fear and they had great joy. They had fear because of what had happened on the outside, but they had joy still raining down on the inside. Those, those are what we call mixed emotions. And I would submit to you that if you're serious about carrying out the Lord's command, you will at times experience some mixed emotions. Huh? Fear, yeah, fear, fear is visceral. That's 
internal. Fear is not logical. In fact, when you back up to verse 5, look at it. The messenger told them in verse 5, what? Not to be afraid. But what somebody tells you in verse 5 and what you actually feel in verse 8 are two different things all together. So here they are, these two sisters in our text, doing what the Lord said do. Running to tell his disciples. And verse 9 says, when suddenly Jesus met them. Do you know how powerful it is to follow God's plan and to have God to show up and to give you his presence? You, you missed that. I think I better say that again. How powerful it is for God to give you his plan and then God show up and give you his presence. These sisters were moving forward with God's plan and the Lord granted them his presence. Sometimes even with fear, we have to move forward with faith in God's plan and watch and see how God will grant us his presence. In fact, that's the first lesson this text has to teach us. When you are trying to do what the Lord told you to do, yeah. verse 8 says he will show up. Verse 9 says he will show up and bless you with his presence. And when you do that, that's a reason to rejoice. Come on, say, I got a reason to rejoice. Yeah. In fact, it gets better. Look at verse 9. It gets even better. Look at this passage. When, when you are trying to do what the Lord told you to do. Yeah, like in verse 8, and you are experiencing mixed emotions, and your emotions are all over the place. I know I just brushed by somebody's situation. There's joy, yes, but sometimes there's fear. Sometimes there's frustration, yes, sometimes there's faith. Sometimes there's even anger, and sometimes there's hesitation. Even while your emotions are mixed, however, when the Lord shows up and blesses you with his presence, you got a reason to rejoice. Please notice, now don't miss this. Look, they are not in church either. Oh, somebody just missed that. Look, look, this, I told you this text is getting even better and better. Look, what, what does your text say? Some, sometimes the Lord will show up while you are on your way to where he sent you. Okay, you missed that. Let me give it to you. Now. What, what about this? Sometimes the Lord will show up while you are on your way somewhere. That should have covered all of us. Huh? So, sometimes the Lord will show up in your car. Sometimes the Lord will show up on a bus drive. Sometimes the Lord will show up in your house. Sometimes the Lord will show up in your living room. But when he shows up and blesses you with his presence, you got a reason to what? To rejoice. I love it. Look at verse 9. They stopped what they were doing. Mm -hmm. They took a little time out to rejoice in the Lord. They, they paused on their pilgrimage to give God praise. They paused on their way to do what the Lord told them to do, just to spend a little time worshiping him. Let me give you a little holy hand. Ask your name. You got time for a holy hand? The person you see next to you. I, I, ask him. I got a holy hand for you. Let me give you a little holy hand. Look at it. Look at it. I'm in the text. This is what I call a new habit that you can develop right here on your own. Look at it. That will help you no matter what you're going through. Look, the next time the Lord shows up and grants you his presence, you ought to just press the grace and then give him the praise. Oh, I love it. I love it. Look, what does Philippians say? Rejoice in the Lord, what? Always. Again, I say rejoice. If, if you feel his presence and you're at home, you can still rejoice. If, if you feel his presence and you're on the job, you can still rejoice. If you're driving in your car, you ought to pull over and just give him the praise. Do like these sisters. Pause on your pilgrimage and rejoice in the Lord no matter where you are. Huh? You ought to lift up holy hands. He did say, where two or three are gathered together in my name, I'm going to be in the midst. And if you feel the Lord's presence, then you ought to take some time out and give the Lord what? Some praise. That's number that's number one. When the Lord blesses you with his presence, mm. you got a reason to rejoice. Yes. And then notice, notice in verse 10, if you will, notice it. Verse 10 gives us a tip that most of us miss. Look, look, verse 10 says, then Jesus said, do not be afraid. Fear not. Go tell my brothers to go where? To Galilee. There they will see you. The sisters, look at verse 10, were still afraid. But they worshiped him Anyhow, what is the text saying? The sisters, now look at them, with emotions all over the place that could have kept them from worshiping, but, but you don't let your emotions get in the way of your devotion. No, in fact, write that down. Let me say it again. Don't let your emotions get in the way of your devotion. Don't, don't let what you're feeling 
stop you from praising. That, that's what David was saying in verse in, in the 34th division of the book of Psalms. I will bless the Lord what at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. I'll bless him when I feel like it, and I'm gonna bless him when I don't feel like it. At all times, his praise shall what continually be in my mouth. When my emotions are down, I'm gonna praise him, and when my emotions are up, I'm gonna still praise him. When my emotions are raw and on a roller coaster ride, I don't let my emotions get in the way of my devotion. You gotta still praise him. These women had mixed emotions, but they worship the Lord. Anyhow, and when the Lord blesses you with his presence, no matter what your emotional state may be, that is a moment for you to pull up, pull up, and give God the praise. When he speaks to you out of his word, you ought to get, you got a reason to rejoice. When the Lord blesses you with his presence, listen, listen, you don't have to explain it to nobody. Just take a little time out and do what? To worship him. Now, now the years have taught me that. The years have taught me that if you don't feel his presence, then you don't fake this praise. Huh? If, but if you feel his presence, huh, then, then you ought to what? Give him the praise. Look, now, now look, 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 let me hurry on. Let me hurry on. You see, you, you got problems in your life. You got stuff that comes up in your life that will send your emotions across the hill. Huh? You got emotional issues. You want to uh, uproar. So, so does everyone else. But, but the song says, "What? Well, forget about yourself. Concentrate on him and." Worship him. Then, then, then when you keep reading this passage, what, what did Jesus tell the women to tell the brothers in verse 10? Look at it. Tell my brothers, Jesus said, go to go to Galilee. There they will see you. Now keep reading because now in verse 16 it says, now the 11 disciples went to Galilee to the mountain to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, stop right there. Here's lesson number two, lesson number two. When the Lord keeps his promise, you got a reason to rejoice. Yeah. Okay, say all both of them. Come on, say when, when the Lord grants you his presence, you got a reason to rejoice. And when the Lord grants you his promise, when the Lord keeps a promise, you got another reason to rejoice. I'm in the text. Look at verse 7 with the right quick. Look, verse 7 says, go tell them to meet. Him there. Tell my brothers to go to Galilee. I will meet them there. He kept that promise. When the Lord keeps a promise, what well, you got a reason to rejoice. Think about all the Lord's promises to you. Yeah. Huh? He promised pardon for sin, and he kept that promise. He he promised peace that passes all understanding. Think about the peace that you've experienced, even in the midst of a pandemic, even in the midst of your last storm. That, that was no accident. That was no coincidence. That was simply God's providence showing up to keep God promised. He, he promised that he would not leave you. He promised that he would not forsake you. He promised no weapon formed against you shall prosper. And he kept that promise. He promised weeping may endure for a night, but joy. Somebody ought to just give him praise right now, because joy is is coming what in the morning when you stop and think about the Lord's promises you got a reason to rejoice huh? he promised as the old preacher said bread when I'm hungry he promised to give me water and eat them when I'm thirsty he promised grace when I fail he promised mercy when I mess up he promised strength when I'm weak and forgiveness still on the cross when the Lord keeps a promise you got a reason to Rejoice. Lesson number one, when he blesses you with his presence, you got a reason to rejoice. Lesson number two, when the Lord keeps his promise, you got a reason to rejoice. And then as I heard to my close, look at verse 17. Let me show you this last lesson, and then I'll do when they saw him. Look at verse 17. It says, when they saw him. You see, you see, the last time they saw him was in Gethsemane. And for some of them, that was the last time they saw him. Others, for some of them, the last time they saw him was on Godless Hill. Huh? And, and the text says when they saw him, not in Gethsemane, look at it, not, not in Galilee, but where? In Galilee, just like he said. Look at verse 16. That means when they saw him, they had to recognize his power. Somebody's still missing this. See, see, that's why we need to keep reading, because if you keep reading, the verse says all power in heaven and in earth has been given to me. Good God for saying, when you recognize the Lord's power, hmm, power over death, power over disease, power over depression, 
you got a reason to rejoice. When you recognize his power over the grave, power over grief, power over the grit and the grind to wipe out your record sheet, power with this precious blood, blood that will what? Never lose his power. Power over his priceless blood, blood that will never lose his power. P power to cancel out sin. I'm in the text. Power to create a new you. You got a reason to rejoice. Power to transform. Power to reform. Power to make brand new you. Power to reconcile. Power to give you another chance. Power to wipe out your past. Power to give you a future. When you recognize the Lord's power, you got a reason to rejoice. Anybody know that the Lord has been powerful operating in your life? I heard a songwriter say, when I, when I can look and see his hand of mercy, when I can hear his voice and cheer, just the time I meet him, he's always here. Come on, y'all, thank God for his presence. Come on, thank God for his power. Thank him for, for being a provider. Thank him for taking care of me, even in the midst of the trial, in the midst of the storm. God has showed up and showed up and given us what we need in order to make it to the moment. Thank God for what he's doing. And we thank him for what he's already done. Huh? The Bible says that he's Adam's redeemer. Yeah. He's Eve's tree of life. He's Abel's vindicator. He's Samson's strength. He's Solomon's wisdom. He's Jacob's dream. He's Ezekiel's will in the middle of the field. And he's my all in all. And because he's my all in all, I'm going to thank him. I'm going to praise him for his presence. Thank you. 